This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hindu's In Focus podcast. I'm Zubeda Hamid, your host for today. The Union Health Ministry issued a set of draft guidelines on a subject that has mostly remained somewhat taboo in India, passive euthanasia. The guidelines have stated that doctors should take considered decisions on the withdrawal of life support in terminally ill patients or consider not giving life support measures in such patients under certain conditions. This is not the first time passive euthanasia has come up in recent times. Despite India not having any legislation around it, the Supreme Court allowed for it in a decision in 2018 stating that people had a right to die with dignity. The court also allowed for citizens to make living wills or advanced medical directives. So what is passive euthanasia? Following the Supreme Court decision, have living wills been made and are these being implemented in hospitals? What is the role of palliative medicine in end-of-life care and support? And how can doctors and families ensure that patients have compassionate and dignified deaths? We delve into these questions and more with Dr. M. R. Rajagopal, Chairman Emeritus of Pallium India and Adjunct Professor of Global Oncology at Queen's University in Canada. Good morning and welcome to the Hindus in Focus podcast, Dr. Rajagopal. Hello, Subeda. Pleasure to be here. Doctor, let's start with the basics. Can you explain to us what passive euthanasia is? Let us talk about what it is now in India. And I wish I could give a more direct, clear answer. But that terminology is confusing. The Indian Council of Medical Research, its bioethics unit in 2018, defined these terms rather clearly. According to that, the term passive euthanasia is a misnomer. This is an important point because euthanasia involves according to the ICMR and the general consensus, the intentional act of killing a terminally ill patient on voluntary request by the direct intervention of a doctor for the purpose of the good of the patient. See the word. It may sound brutal, but however good the intention, euthanasia is killing and it cannot be passive. So that's the scientific approach, whereas in its 2018 judgment and in 2023 judgment, the Supreme Court uh, has used the term passive euthanasia for allowing natural death, withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment does not have the intention to kill. It is only allowing natural death. So, if you ask me what is passive euthanasia, because India has no law governing it, because then the Supreme Court judgment takes precedence over everything else, passive euthanasia is used in India to mean withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. For example, uh, a dying man goes on a ventilator. Happens all the time. That is cruel and if instead of putting the person on uh, artificial life support measures like ventilator, that is avoided and the person is allowed to a natural death, that is compassionate. Now if he is old or she is already on a life-sustaining treatment like the ventilator, that needs to be withdrawn. And that is also only allowing natural death. You are not doing anything to kill someone. You are only permitting the person to go with as much dignity and comfort as possible. So that would be passive euthanasia as it stands in India today. That's a very clear definition. Thank you, doctor. Talk to us a little bit about what is the scenario now. You told us that India has no law governing this, but because of that, the Supreme Court's 2018 and subsequent judgment takes over. What is the scenario in Indian hospitals now with regard to life-sustaining care given to terminally ill patients? And what is a terminally ill patient? What is the definition of that? 
the recent government of india guidelines define terminal illness i don't know where that comes from that is not very clear that's confusing the statutory body of government of india the indian council of medical research in its 2018 document has given this clear terminology i wish the government of india would follow it terminal illness according to them is an irreversible or incurable disease condition from which death is expected in the foreseeable future the word foreseeable is not precise but then in this condition condition it is not possible to be precise so i hope the government of india guidelines will adopt its own statutory body icmr's definition you asked about the current status wish i could give good news the current status is dismal dismal and cruel the whatever be the supreme court uh, orders view about withdrawing i mean they permitted that uh, when appropriate life sustaining treatment should be withdrawn with several clauses true but what is happening all over the country is that when somebody is dying they are pushed into the intensive care unit what should happen is even if they are already in intensive care unit that may happen because you do not know whether the person is dying or not the person comes to an emergency room you don't know whether uh, the person's life can be salvaged so you go on a life support system then it becomes clear that uh, it is not a salvageable situation in which case the person needs to be withdrawn and in india that doesn't happen a very well known intensivist from delhi dr rajkumar mani published a paper fairly recently which showed in intensive care units when a disease condition is considered not salvageable approximately 70% of patients are continued on the life support system till they eventually die their dying process being stretched out each moment is agony and that continues in the other 30% they are usually sent the family says we cannot pay so they are made to sign a document leaving against medical advice and take the person away to die horrible deaths from the hospital what is what would be compassionate all these people should be taken off the life support systems and instead given palliative care that's important because whatever problem they have like breathlessness that needs to be treated now <clears throat> i said the picture in india is dismal compare it with what is happening in european countries roughly around the same time i think it said to the 19 publication which showed that in european union countries in a similar situation where the intensive care does not help approximately 90% of people are taken off the life support systems that's where the 89.6% comes in and only 10% of people happen to die on the life support system that's compassionate let me also also add one more thing the national cancer grid is a collaborative of all cancer hospitals in the country with more than 350 hospitals Uh, headed by the organization headed by dr pramesh a director of the tata memorial hospital in mumbai and these hospitals have come together and created guidelines one of them says in advanced metastatic cancer do not treat patients in intensive care units unless there is a salvageable issue that's what it says but what's happening in the country is truly dismal and cruel so these guidelines you told us what the, what they define as term, a terminal illness as so do you think guidelines such as these are the need of the hour does this need to be translated perhaps into law because right now as you said we only have the supreme court judgment to go on 
the guidelines can only point the way to implementing the supreme court judgment because till the parliament enacts a law the supreme court judgment is for all practical purposes the law no government guideline today can overrule the supreme court judgment there is no doubt about it the the role of the guidelines would be to help doctors and patients and families in implementing this so there cannot be a conflict that's very clear now if some problems with the supreme court judgment are to be overcome it will have to be the parliament enacting a law indeed in 2016 the government almost did they published a draft law in the government of india website and asked the public to respond and we also did our organization also submitted a response unfortunately the matter was not taken up by the parliament at that time so unless there is a law the guideline can only be supportive of what the supreme court judgment says and can never be conflicting talk to us a little bit about something that the guidelines mentioned and something that came up in the supreme court judgment in 2018 Uh, what is commonly known as a living will or an advanced medical directive what is this and is this being implemented in india after the 2018 judgment between 2018 and 2023 i am not aware of even one human being in india going through the process described by the judgment and getting a compassionate end never not happened because the process laid down was so complicated even now unfortunately though the supreme court validated the advance medical directive though the supreme court also validated and uh, people's and right to be taken off life support systems to die a more compassionate death still the process much more uh, much less complicated than 2018 still too complicated i think when we talk about withdrawal of life support everybody is thinking only about the sensational situations like aruna shanbag who remained on in a vegetative state for more than 30 years no this is something that happens in every single hospital every day numerous people die and please remember that life on a ventilator is not fun it's terrible a tube catheter going into the lungs to support the mucus feels agonizing and uh, every moment is an agony and here we talk about a primary medical board which is fine which would have been easy and then the dm the director of med- the district medical officer getting involved how much a bureaucracy how busy a person is he appointing another secondary medical board which includes the head of the institution the director or somebody who may not know anything about the science of this so i fear the problems are still huge tell us what in an ideal situation a living will or an advanced medical directive would look like in for instance if i had to make one what would it be what would it be like and how would i go about it we we already have an excellent uh, document uh, following the supreme court guidelines a collaborative of uh, indian association of critical care medicine and indian association of palliative care it's called lsat elicit has come out with a draft uh, and it's on their website and the document is available so it will be a f- just three or four pages typically listing what exactly you want and this can be customized i have written it my my own where i have said that uh, that saying that i am so and so etc making this document when in full possession of my my full possession of my faculties and i am saying that in the context of an incurable illness from which 
return to reasonable quality of life seems unlikely i should not be put on life support systems uh, artificial life support systems i have put in i don't even unless i am hungry i don't want artificial feeding others may have different views about that but i everybody will certainly say in that condition they don't want to be in intensive care unit what would people want i have written that down i want to be with my family who are available family and friends a final farewell should be possible not an inhumane cold prolonged death painful death in an icu that's what i have put in there now the most important part of course it has to be witnessed and countersigned by at least a gazetted of a gazetted officer or a notary but that's what the uh, uh, writing part is but i think the most important part of the preparation of an advanced medical directive is to make sure that the whole of the immediate family is in agreement i have talked about this to my wife and my two sons and ensured that they understand it and they will agree because if at that point of time the family doesn't agree or have disagreement between them then i'll continue to suffer whatever the law or the judgment says because no sensible doctor will i want to antagonize the family let's talk a little bit about communication with the family and that, the importance of that um a section of the the ima president actually the indian medical association's president actually spoke out against these guidelines and said that this should be an issue that has to be decided between doctors and patients families on a case to case basis uh tell us about the importance of communicating with the patients families because often terminally ill patients are obviously not in a position to be able to make their own decisions what happens in these cases and why is the ima stand the way it is i think the ima has a big point according to the current draft guidelines that for which came out from the government this is not a problem with the supreme court judgment problem with the guidelines alone according to that if the person has left no advance medical directive it is up to the doctors to convene the board and decide that is that that has to be changed no because the these are only draft guidelines they are welcoming comments and from the organization that i represent palium india we will submit we are in the process of preparation of a document to submit where we will clearly say when i am no longer having decision making capacity if i have not made an advance medical directive the right over my life is automatically going to my family and if they are in agreement then we should go proceed so that step is absolutely essential imagine the real life situation i am lying there in the hospital i am dying the family may have a hundred opinions they may actually want me to take to another hospital it's up to them the doctors cannot say no you can't take him stay here we'll convene a primary medical board which will give its opinion within two days then we'll inform the dmo convene a secondary medical board which is asked to give report preferably within two days we don't know how long the dmo will take to appoint the board and that my family has no right over this this is not acceptable to me so that bit will have to be added this will have to be shared decision making that's the catch phrase if i am not competent to take a decision it will be shared decision making between my family and the medical system that can be the only way talk to us a little bit doctor about the role that palliative care can have in these kinds of situations you said that one of the things uh, that uh, the 
hospitals that are networked under a cancer, all the cancer hospitals in the country had come up with was that don't offer treatment in some cases. And in those cases, perhaps palliative care could be a better option. What is the role? And do you do you uh, do you believe that a bigger role is necessary for palliative medicine? Most certainly. Uh, just uh, one small correction. The National Cancer Grid document does not say don't offer treatment because palliative care is also treatment. Palliative care is the humane, compassionate treatment that you give where you treat the physical symptoms. Again, let me take to your, take you to a real life scenario. Uh, the person was not breathing enough and is put on the artificial ventilator. On the ventilator, he is not happy, obviously, nobody will be, but you decide to take it away. When you take the tube out, the person will be intensely breathless. They may, I may even say, bring it back, bring it back. That breathlessness has to be treated. The one humane thing that we can do to a person who is having suffering due to an illness is to relieve the suffering. When it is, that may happen along with the treatment and eventually palliative care is not only for the terminally ill, that is a part of it. So eventually when the person is dying, again, the breathlessness has to be treated. The pain has to be treated. The person has to receive compassionate love from the family. They need to be together. All this is palliative care. Palliative care is treatment of the physical suffering, emotional suffering, social suffering, and spiritual suffering. Whatever is the spiritual pursuit that the person believes in, which may be just having people read Bhagavad Gita, it may be people asking for a last communion, it may be any spiritual leader and coming and blessing the person, that also is an important part. For the people who believe in it, that's vitally important. So palliative care is all this, and has to be available. Actually, later this year, this is not a judgment, but in response to a petition, the Supreme Court made a statement that the right to life with dignity involves right to health, which in, has to involve right to palliative care. So there's already a Supreme Court statement that palliative care is indeed a right, part of the right to health. And here, this becomes critically important. Not only for the person who is going, but also the family. How someone dies leaves a permanent impression on the person's psyche for those who are left behind. And that's also important. They should have some pleasant memories, like a final hug or a kiss on the forehead. Those are precious too. Thank you, Doctor. That was very clear. Just a couple more questions before we wrap up. One of the uh, many issues in India is that is part of it is the whole financial hardship, correct, that uh, prolonged ICU care puts on a patient's family. Uh, is that also a consideration that should be that, that should be taken into account? Yes and no. Indeed, catastrophic health expenditure is a huge problem. Every year, more than 4% of our population, that was in 2015 estimate, 50, 55 million, 5.5 crores of Indians are pushed below poverty line by the cost of treatment. And the bulk of the treatment cost happens towards the end of life. That's horrendous, destroying the next generations also. So it is a problem. But when I am talking to a family who are facing the death of a loved one, I wouldn't bring it up. I don't want their son or daughter to think that if I had more money, my dad could have been alive. If I was rich, my mom could have survived. That is not 
the consideration the here the consideration is the person has a right and person has a right to life with dignity and to life and to treatment of suffering that's what i will trust i don't want to uh, leave the family with a burden of guilt about the expenditure but the expenditure is indeed a huge problem no doubt last question doctor uh, we in india are not very comfortable talking about that death at all uh, we don't talk about how we want to die we don't talk about when we are going to die we don't talk about wills forget advanced medical directives even regular wills is this taboo subject should this change i mean do we need to talk more about death and the way we would like to see ourselves dying yes we have become a death illiterate society so be that that's in your generation <laughs> that was not so in my childhood we as children grew up seeing that i have seen my grandparents dying grand grand parents dying i have seen cattle dying in the cattle shed death we came to accept without anybody having to tell us was a part of life but now since then it is not part of the indian culture we we were we we used to talk about that we used to prepare ourselves for that but it is the modern so called civilization the nuclearization of families which uh, caused this change so that we now have become a death illiterate country and that is a huge problem death is the inevitable consequence of life and we should be able to talk about it and we need to be aware of it because if we are death illiterate then the time comes we will not be able to cross that bridge it's easy to say we'll cross the bridge when we come to it but that's not an easy bridge to cross so thank you for asking that particular question death literacy what you are doing with this conversation bringing death back in a way a, a, a lancet commission report says bring death back to life we will have to accept that it is inevitable and that has to have its own beauty gentleness dignity and it should be compassionate thank you very much for speaking to us today doctor this was such a wonderful conversation thank you thank you thank you very much in focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues in the meantime you can find our podcast on spotify apple podcasts stitcher and other platforms just search for in focus by the hindu we'll see you soon